friendly means fuel and uh, we have uh, a number of fuels that we use coal for example oil gases nuclear energy and so on and uh, this graph represents as a function of year how these particular type of fuels have been explored exploited and its usage has either peaked or is coming to an end some of them you can see or for example the violet color representing uh, 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 the, the bluish color representing coal for example is already peaked by 2020 its usage is now coming down the reason is that not only is coal very polluting so people do not want to use that but the total uh, storage stockage stockpiles of coal is also shrinking so similarly other types of uh, what we call uh, fuels which are uh, sustainable are coming to an end non sustainable fuels are coming to an end next one so if this trend goes on by the year 2050 people expect that all these non sustainable fuels like coal gas oil and so on would come to an end and what do we do beyond that 2050 period 2050 and remember i mentioned 2050 as a period in which you will be uh, in, the, in the in in the middle of your career your 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 growth your well being everything depends on what you see in 2050 so if we lose uh, these fuels by that time the only fuel available then would be nuclear energy and that itself has a lot of problem because conventional nuclear energy like fission where you use uranium is already giving us a lot of problems next one please next next Next. Now, here is a summary of India's energy future. By 2100, India's population would become of the order of 165 crores. And uh, we will have one of the large economies of the world, 22 trillion dollars. We will need power generation capacity of the order of 1000 gigawatts. 1 gigawatt is a, a billion watts, so 1000 gigawatts is what we need. And uh, by the time hydrocarbon fuels would have been depleted and uh, nuclear energy will dominate the energy mix. Next one. Now, at present we use a form of nuclear energy which is called fission energy. Nuclear energy by, by fissioning uranium or plutonium or such heavy elements and the breaking up of the nuclei will release energy in the form of neutrons and those neutrons can be made to absorb on on uh, materials which will get heated up and steam can be generated and then it can drive turbines and so on and uh, that is the present form of nuclear energy that for example the Atomic Energy Commission in India exploits that kind of nuclear energy. But there is another type of nuclear energy which is not exploited so far on Earth. This is what is called fusion. Here, two light nuclei, like isotopes of hydrogen, would fuse together and release energy. This is uh, precisely what happens inside a hydrogen bomb. And this is also what happens inside sun. So your reference to Sastika earlier, which is a symbol of the sun, has very much to do with what I am going to speak today. Next, next please. <clears throat> now, here is a picture of the sun on the left side. The interior of the sun has a temperature of 15 million degrees. The center of the sun has a temperature of 15 million degrees 
and the gravity of the sun compresses matter to a very very high pressure at the center which is like 340 billion atmospheric pressure pressure on the surface of earth is one atmospheric pressure third 40 billion atmospheric pressure is the center of the sun and so under these conditions of very high temperature and very high pressure light nuclei like uh, hydrogen in the sun gets converted fused into helium and into larger and heavier and heavier uh, nuclei and in this process sun releases energy by this fusion process and uh, sun has been burning all these years by converting hydrogen into helium and uh, you can you can say Yeah, this is a multi-step process. It doesn't happen in one step. A number of steps are, are used to do this conversion. But this is a, a sustained process. And the uh, sun has been burning for so many years. By this process, it gives us energy. So the people, man, has been asking this question. If this can happen in the sun, why can we make it happen on Earth? Can we build, for example, a miniature sun on Earth so that this reaction can give us energy? Why am I interested in that? Next slide. The same process. If I do it on the Earth, I can use uh, deuterium and tritium, which are isotopes of hydrogen, to fuse and release energy and each uh, DT fusion releases uh, 17.6 MeV as energy. It is 30, each reaction is 30 million times larger than a chemical reaction and its fuel, fuel is deuterium which you can collect from sea 6,000 atoms of normal hydrogen for 6,000 atoms of normal hydrogen in the seawater there is one atom of deuterium so if we filter deuterium from the sea that will adequately supply us fuel for many many millions of years and similarly tritium can be generated by converting lithium into, into tritium so fuels are plenty available. You don't have to worry about the fuel being depleted after a number of years. Only thing that you have to do is that this reaction happens at a temperature of 200 million degrees. So you must know how to go to a system where 200 million degrees would be persistently, consistently produced so that fusion reaction can happen. So fusion is good because it uses fuels which are very easily available. The only problem is that it demands a ambient temperature of 200 million degrees which you certainly will agree that not an easy job to do. So how have people been uh, trying to, to solve this problem? Next slide. <coughs> There are two approaches to making this miniature sun on Earth. One is imitating the hydrogen bomb by in a, in a small scale. So I take a small pellet of deuterium tritium on the left hand side, the blue sphere, few millimeter in size, and outside that pellet I coat and make a small film of uh, uh, a metal, gold for example, then on the gold surface I shine hundreds of uh, beams of laser power, light beams, concentrated light beams, hundreds of 200 beams shine on the surface. That sudden uh, shining of the outer gold surface evaporates gold, gold flies away. 
So it's like now a tiny rocket. The gold flying away gives a kick in the reverse direction to the material that it left. So 100 points fly away, 100 kicks are delivered to the solid and then the solid gets compressed. And then progressively the compression heats up and uh, increases the temperature of the center, finally reaches a temperature where fusion reaction can be ignited and then the pellet blows up, blows away and it's like a tiny hydrogen bomb. It's tiny because you cannot afford to have a full hydrogen bomb doing this. So this process goes on repeating and this is called what is called inertial fusion. So a fusion in which everything happens in such a short time that the it's initial time before everything flies away, the energy is released. And of course you can convert that energy into steam and all that outside. So this is one approach and this is being followed by two major laboratories in the world, one in uh, Europe and the other in the US. Next slide please. The, the European, uh, the U US lab laboratory is shown here. This is a system which uh, houses what is called National Ignition Facility, which has 192 beamlets of laser irradiating that pellet and uh, they have not succeeded so far. They have reached extremely high temperatures and so on, but uh, they are still far away from full success. Next one. In the next idea, which is basically a Russian idea, I use the principle of a transformer. The yellow frame is the transformer core. Those who are doing electrical engineering will realize that. It's a transformer core and on the right hand side I have a hollow ring going around the transformer secondary. So if I excite the transformer primary, a current can be driven in the secondary like in any transformer. A primary excitation drives a current in the secondary. But here the current would be driven in the gas contained in the ring and uh, that gas is hydrogen and so that gas will get ionized because an electric field will be produced inside the ring. The ring is called a torus and the electric field will break down uh, gases and convert that into a plasma. The plasma is an ionized gas and the ionized gas is a conducting gas so it can drive a current and if you reach a current of the order of a million ampere which is an enormous current because your usual outlet drives a current of the order of few amperes. So if you reach the order of a million amperes then the temperature can reach the kind of temperature that we need, millions of degrees. And uh, now you have a situation where you have produced a plasma at a million degree, but remember that this plasma is now extremely, it consists of extremely fast moving uh, electrons and ions, and it will fly away in no time. So you have to keep the plasma together. That is why those yellow, the green rings, which are magnetic field coils, which produce a certain type of magnetic field inside the ring, which keeps the plasma away from the wall so that plasma doesn't fly away and get lost. So this is a, a system which was invented by the Russians. It is a toroidal chamber with the magnetic field and in Russian it becomes toroidal camber with mag magnetic field. So it's called a tokamak. It's a device for using very high temperature plasma. Chocomax is uh, one form of uh, uh, fusion uh, device. The other one, inertial fusion we have seen earlier. Next one. This is another figure of the tokamak, the ring current and so on. Next, please. Next figure. Now this is the tokamak 
that we have built in India in uh, 1990 and uh, it's called Aditya to represent its connection to sun. It's, it doesn't go to millions of degrees but reaches order of one million degree temperature for short times. So we have been trying to learn how to make high temperature plasmas at the institute in Ahmedabad and uh, this is part of that uh, exercise in building and learning how to do these things. Next slide please. This is another device which has been built at the Institute for Plasma Research. It's called a Superconducting Steady State Tokamak, which is the even larger device and still on the path to fusion. Next. Now, tokamaks are plenty in the world. Many, many countries work in this field. So this is a figure where the central temperature, the ion temperature or the plasma temperature is plotted against the what is called the fusion product. And you see the many devices where the temperature has already reached 100 indicates 100 kilo electron volt, which is like a sub mega electron volt, which is a very, very high temperature, hundreds of millions of degrees, and a number of devices operate in that regime. Next. Now, tokamak research has been going on for a long time, but people were reluctant to build a device large enough to produce fusion because it was very expensive. You need billions of dollars to build a reactor like that. But a breakthrough happened in the 1985 Geneva summit when Gorbachev and Reagan met together and discussed the possibility of a collaboration, a international collaboration where a large enough tokamak would be built which will prove the point of fusion and will be useful for uh, building uh, later devices. Next slide please. And uh, this idea has been followed through by many, many people. Many countries joined together and in uh, 2005, India also joined this project of uh, ITER, International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, and uh, this is one of the seven countries which joined ITER, and the agreement was signed and ratified. Now ITER is a reality, it's a project which is already happening. Next, Next slide please. Now, ITER will be built in, the, in a place called Cadarache in the south of France and uh, on the right bottom you see the world map, all the blue, blue countries are participating in ITER it as United States, it is Europe, it is Russia, China, Japan, India, they are all parties to building this eater machine in uh, Gadarash. And each country is supposed to contribute 10% of the cost of the reactor, which is itself an extremely costly machine, runs in the billions of euros. So India will contribute 10% and other countries will also contribute 10%. Next slide, please. Now, this is a picture of the machine that will be built. It's, it's, it's a ITER device in all its complexity and uh, at the bottom you can probably see a very small uh, figure standing there. I don't know if you can see that person standing at the bottom, a blue shirted person. So that is the size of the person. So you can imagine the size of the machine which will be like a, a three-storied, four-storied building of magnets and steel and vacuum chambers and uh, various components of the machine and uh, this will be assembled in that place which I call Cadarash. Next slide please. Now part
participating in ITER, that means building ITER, is a cooperative project. As I said, each country would contribute to 10%, but not in money, but in parts. So if there is a magnetic coil required, a country will contribute that. If there is a transformer required, another country will contribute that, and so on. So India's contribution in uh, building the ITER is uh, listed here. The entire machine will be covered by a cryostat, a vacuum chamber. So when you look at ITER in actual built form, you will not see any of this. You will see a big chamber. And that chamber is being built by India in Larsen and Tubro in Bombay. And uh, this is the largest vacuum chamber in the world. And it is being built in parts and sent to France, which will be assembled there. So similarly, other things will be built, power supplies, cooling system, and so on. These are all responsibilities of India in building ITER. Next slide, please. This is, for example, the water cooling system, which is designed in India, partially fabricated in India, and sent to France, where it will be assembled in the in the in the system. It's a it's like any refrigeration system. Heat is removed by cool water circulating in, in pipes. Next. This is another system which is being, being delivered by India. It's called a diagnostic neutral beam for measuring the plasma pro properties within the heater device. It shoots a neutral hydrogen beam into the plasma and then measures what happens to the hydrogen beam and correlates the change in the beam property to the properties of the plasma. So this is another, this is a fairly sophisticated device. It's being built by India, supplied to ITER. Next, please. As I said, the largest vacuum chamber in the world, the cryostat, is being built by India. It will be supplied, it's already being supplied, it's being assembled in in uh, France at this time. So we have a group of about 150 scientists working in Cadarache, taking care of these things when things get have to be assembled and so on. Next slide, please. This is another subsystem. It's called uh, ITER, ICRF system. It's an ion cyclotron resonant heating system, which will be again supplied for uh, for increasing the temperature of the plasma in ITER. Next. Now, where do we stand in terms of overall growth of fusion in the world vis-a-vis -vis our participation in ITER? We, as I said, we started the fusion program in 1972 where a small machine like Tokamak Aditya was built. Then, we built uh, the steady state tokamak, which is on the right and bottom side. Then we were able to participate in ITER as a member country. In that participation, we will learn a lot of plasma physics. We will also be involved in developing and learning a lot of technologies required for fusion. And then Possibly by 2022, we will build a second version of steady state tokamak and, and so on. So by that time, ITER would also get operational and we will know whether this idea would succeed or not. This is the demonstration of fusion as an energy source. Once ITER succeeds, then other countries, all member countries would start building their own reactors which will actually be producing fusion. So in uh, about 2025, ITER would start working and, and showing whether it's a successful idea. If it is a success, then possibly by 2050, demo reactors would be built. And that is the time we actually need fusion because as I said, by that time, the fossil fuels would have vanished from Earth and we would certainly need advanced forms of nuclear energy. And so the pace of fusion learning is in consonance with 
our requirement of fusion energy and if things succeed then we hope that we will have fusion by that time. Next slide please. Now here is a, a view of the IPR campuses. We have on the left, left hand side this is our major campus in Gandhinagar where I used to work. And on the right hand side, a group of people who built SST machine. And uh, you can see large number of young people are associated. They're all engineers like uh, in electrical, mechanical, computer, uh, RF systems and so on. And uh, many young people come and join this program because they see it as something of relevance for the next 50 years or so. And at the bottom, we have this place where ITER project is managed from India. It's, it's, it's an entity called ITER India, where a number of people work in building components for ITER and supplying to ITER. And the, on the bottom left hand side, it's a center which has been set up to convert plasma physics into useful technologies like uh, how to use plasmas for destroying waste, for example, that's one project, or various other projects and so on. So, let me conclude here by saying that fusion is a very desirable form of nuclear energy and fusion is the energy which runs the universe and there is no reason why Earth cannot also gain from fusion. And the problem is that fusion demands extremely high temperatures, very advanced materials and so on. And so it's a technologically demanding field of research. But India has taken steps to start learning this technology by building a number of small devices and also participating in major programs like ITER so that when things are ready, we would be in a position to absorb that knowledge and build reactors of our own. And we hope that this would be a successful thing in the future. So let me stop here and thank all of you for a very patient listening. Thank you very much.
Swastika 2K17 has begun. Reverend Father C. John Chetara, Director of MBC. Today's Chief Guest Padmashree, Dr. P.I. John. Our Guest Judge, Mr. Rahul Ishwar. The Dr. Pradeep Singh, our Principal. Barsa, Dr. Rajan Parikar. Student Advisor, Reverend Father Kurvil Parma Chako. Chief Faculty Advisor, Mrs. Josby Josh. Staff Coordinator, Mr. Arjun Hari. HODs of all departments, all teaching and non-teaching staffs, and all my dear friends. A very good morning to one and all. I'm here to thank each one of you for gracing this occasion with your presence. I firstly thank our Director Rachin for bringing such a strong pillar of support. I thank our Chief Guest, Padmashree Dr. P.I. John, for spending his valuable time with us and enlightening the MBC family. I thank our Principal for all the guidance and support he has given to make Swastika what it is. I thank our Bassa for all his support and words of advice. I thank our Kuruvil for always being there to make every venture in this college a grand success. I thank our Chief Faculty Advisor, Joe Smimis, for being the rock of support for Swastika. I thank our Student Advisor, Arjun Hari, for all his guidance. I thank the HODs of all departments and all the staff, teaching and non-teaching, for supporting us to make Swastika what it is. I thank all our guest judges for being here, and I would like to thank Indigo Talent Hunt for making, a part, making us a part of their event. I also thank all our sponsors of Swastika. Last but not the least, I thank all of these students who have put all the effort to make Swastika a grand success. Thank you. <laughs> 